So we are going to get started, and I hope that everyone online can hear me just fine, right? Hey. Okay. So um, we're going to start demo day. Welcome to demo day and our winter spring cohort. And I, we're going to start with an introduction with our dean, Lisa Ordonez. Everybody online. So here's how many people do we have online? Uh, 21. All right. And I think we can keep going. So thank you all for coming. Welcome to demo, uh, to demo Day. This is an important part of our Demo Day uh, program, our starter program. And it is critical to success in this case. Starter is 100% funded through philosophy and scholarships and sponsorships would not be possible without the support of our mentors, donors, sponsors, and the community. The generosity of our donors and sponsors helps develop entrepreneurial leaders by providing resources to spur innovation and the creation of new starters locally and across our globe. Thank you to our family of supporters and sponsors. A special thank you to this year's sponsors, Jin Shu, the Epstein Family Foundation, Irwin and Alicia Milan, the Daniel Reed Memorial Fund, Robert and Julia Sullivan, Julie Sullivan, Shepard Moen Richter Hampton LLP, Wilson Sosini, Goodrich, Murazaki, and Cooley. Your contributions are invaluable. Equally important as our mentors, advisor teams, and I met several tonight, and to you all, not just while the teams are participating in Start R, but also through the networks of advisors, seasoned executives successful entrepreneurs and, in, and investors that are the core of our ecosystem and essential to the success and growth of these amazing companies. We are enormously grateful for the generosity of your time and wisdom. And now I have the pleasure of introducing our MCs for the evening. We have our Executive Director, Jim Schwartz, and our Start Our Director, Professor Ken Dixie. Thank you. Greetings, I'm Tim Schwartz, the Executive Director of SEED, California Institute for Innovation and Development. And I'm pleased to introduce the team of which Tim has a critical role in directing Stardart, as well as Karen Hansen and Diana Knashwan, as well as we have three faculty members who are advisors, of a committee of advisors, Onamir, um, let's get this right, Rick Townsend and Amy Nguyen. But our team is really made up of uh, people that are judging tonight and the mentors that, excuse me, the mentors that uh, Lisa already introduced. It is all about the network. Without the network that we have, uh, you are the multiplier that allows us to succeed. You're the multiplier that allows us to succeed and advise, mentor, engage these students and invest in them. So let me introduce the judges. John Zadowski is uh, with us here today, a bachelor's and master's in electrical engineering and a Harvard MBA. Uh, he says he's an engineer that's turned to startup CFO. John is presently serving as co-founder of Bright Sunny Systems, founder, board member, investment committee member of Assembled Brands, founding investor and fractional CFO at Robin Healthcare, Amino and Kachinga. And his CFO advisor to Trust and Will, Crowdbotics, Topia, and others. Previously, I, I added this up. John has led multiple deals with cumulative valuations of well over a billion dollars. Denise, Denise is a uh, Brady MBA alum. Is it an MBA? Yeah. MBA alum, um, founder, founder of Longley Capital. She has extensive experience helping companies sale, scale, and mitigate risk both as an investor and an operator in the private and public markets. Prior to Longley Capital, Denise was the business modeling leader in Southern California at Ernst & Young. And after spending five years with the firm in New York City, building the valuation and financial model. Thank you for joining. And Steve Pachowski. Steve is a graduate of the first class of Rady students, graduate of our class of 2006. He came to Rady with a PhD from the City University of New York. He's an innovator, 
really a rock star and a pioneer with over 25 years turning pharmaceutical innovations into market a marketed product. In addition to pioneering the delivery of solid biopharmaceuticals, Steve has published over 60 invited book chapters and peer reviewed journal articles and has over 20 issued and 10 pending patent applications in the field of drug formulation and delivery. He has played a key role in the development of commercialization of marketed pharmaceuticals, including Simlin, Bietta, Biodor, and many others. Currently, Steve is the founder and serves as the chief scientific officer at Zerus Pharmaceuticals. Thank you, Steve, for joining us. Thank you. And first of all, welcome to Demo Day. This is our first live event of Demo Day in two years. So we're so <laughs> happy. We've been about our Start Our Program, which is part of SEED. So we started in 2012 with My Start of Access, you might have heard of before. But now we have an umbrella of Start Our Accelerators, there are six. In fact, you're going to hear from one team of our newest accelerator. Start Blue. This is a little bit about our staff. So first of all, welcome and thank you to all of our mentors for not being able to do this. We have over 70 mentors who help all of our programs. Um, some of the other stats were now up to $213 million in fundraising for all of our teams. We're not only seeing our teams succeed in their first startup, but they're going on uh, to their second and sometimes even third. So Martin Gross, our speaker, is going to Tell you a little bit about his entrepreneur journey. And then we've added one new acquisition. So Andrew 360 was acquired um, as well. And then I see a couple of people from Evo Nexus. You've also been very successful as a feeder into some of the other accelerators like Y Combinator and Evo Nexus. We're very proud of that statistic as well. So a little bit on alumni updates. Uh, so Tab 32, one of our first Start Our Ready teams not only opened up a new office in Miami, but just celebrated up their 135th employee. Unfortunately, they're very secretive about their funding, but they did raise a series B. And then Business Cell and Family Proud, two other teams that came from our Start Our Impact, um, they raised SBIR money. Uh, Business Cell, Mia was also part of our Start Our Inclusion. So we're very proud of all the progress that our teams have made. Tonight, you're going to see six teams from four of our programs. Our judges are going to score those. So we're going to have a first and second place team, as well as an audience vote. So both live and um, virtual, we'll be voting for our, your best presentations that the audience votes for. So later on, we'll go through all those teams. But we'd first like to begin by introducing one of our Start Our alumni, not only a Rady MBA alumni, but Martin Gross is a serial entrepreneur, and he's now on his third startup. So Martin, we'd like to welcome you to tell us a little bit about your entrepreneurship. Yes, uh, and it's great to see everybody here, obviously, after two years of being locked away. It's great to be back here and uh, remember what it's like to eat cookies together and get this close to each other. Uh, so I just wanted to highlight a, a few of the reasons why Start R is so important and why they're why it's so important to me. Um, I, I got acquainted with Start R when I was a student at Rady School. Um, I was getting my MBA and I had the ingenious and uh, just unbelievably great idea of starting a medical device company with no uh, bio training, with no medical training, and with no engineering degree. Um, I said that I had the business sense, which meant I didn't know anything at all. <laughs> um, and I, I jumped into Stardar, and they did such a great job of laying out all of the essentials, from A to Z, soup to nuts, what was necessary to get a scalable, impactful startup off the ground. They did such a good job of it, and I have such a good memory that now I go and advise other startups just basically saying what they say, and I get advisory shares in those startups. So thank you for all the <laughs> liquid assets that I'm sitting on. Jim, thank you. Um, so I, I started that medical device company. Things actually did go quite well. Uh, we had our downs, uh, we had our ups. There was some political fraughtness that happened uh, and ended up with a lot of the leadership team leaving, including myself. However, uh, that uh, continued and uh, they actually ended up 
And you may have seen it on Keeping Up with Our Kardashians, uh, as well as uh, Caremark and, and a lot of insurance providers ended up taking on their medical device. So things went quite well. Um, I went on to um, kind of two other highlights that directly involved SARDA. One of them was helping another start our team that was using a urology device. Um, that was Andro 360. Because it's a urology device, uh, I won't talk about what it does in polite company, but it was, it was an important device and it had value. I helped them out just a little bit. They got some funding, uh, got a distribution agreement with them, and then ended up selling the company. Uh, the, the other thing that happened was I got recruited by an investor in my first company to go become president and CEO of a genomics company. So that company was utilizing a cheek swab to find out the predisposition of a man to get prostate cancer. It had failed twice with two other CEOs. I stepped in, and thanks to some of the training, both at Rady and Sardar, I could definitely see the intrinsic value that was there in that test. Um, I basically went in and did that toolkit that Stardar gave me again, and that got off the ground, and that started going. And we went through pilot programs, and we went through clinical trials. Um, I wish I, could, frankly, had a Stardar 2.0 that could help with like the next phase, which was how weird people are at work, and <laughs> people crying in your office, and egos, and all of that stuff. But, uh, but it was fun, and by that I mean it was not fun. But it was good. <laughs> it was good. Yeah. And we ended up we ended up selling recently to a company called Invite, uh, which is a large genomics company. And uh, about five and a half months into a six month stock lockout. Uh, so a fair warning to the people who are presenting today. That means that five and a half months ago, Invite stock since then lost about eighty percent of its value. So I'm still happy. Uh, I'm not Turks and Caicos happy, but I'm still happy. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and you know. Uh, Starter was so essential. The things that I learned, how well organized it was, all these topics along the way, so essential in all those successes. I'm on to a new um, uh, startup, uh, playing around with an ag tech idea that I think is very, very valuable, and I'm doing the same startup things. And I, I wanted to end by saying that, really importantly, when I was at Stratify, which was the prostate cancer test company, I would have guys coming up to me and saying, I didn't know that I had prostate cancer, but I had, I had metastatic prostate cancer. And I didn't know that until I took your test. And I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna get emotional, but they would have known that unless Starter had taught me that. So, all right, um, that's important, that's important. The fact that Starter taught me that. to talk about but thank you martin and thank you also for being a start our mentor for bringing me back as well so let's begin with our first company so i'd like to invite to our stage um paul that's paul <laughs> <laughs> and this is drives and resource so peter and paul thank you thanks man. hi everyone my name is pete major and i'm from drives and detours we're glad to be here with you today over the last two and a half years, how many of you have wanted to get the heck out of your house? Yeah, right? And uh, how many of you went online to search for things to do outside of your house? Right, I know, me too. Except I didn't want to jump on a plane and go anywhere because there was too much COVID. And I got really tired of going to all the popular sites like Balboa Park because I'd already been there a hundred billion times already. And so I found myself actually identifying with a lot of the travel trends that you see up here uh, that have really changed in the United States. COVID has changed the way people travel. They're looking for smaller, more intimate destinations where they can connect with local people, history, and culture. Well, heel travelers are looking for design, authenticity, and personality. And this doesn't just apply to groups. It also applies to, uh, to solo travelers as well, which is a growing demographic in the travel community. They're looking for spontaneity and flexibility. Do any of these travel trends resonate with you? You have to nod. Yeah, cool. Awesome. All right, so essentially mass market is out and unique experiences are in. And so what are you going to do about that? Now, you could go to one of these existing sites like Travelocity and Expedia, and they're overwhelming. There's lots of information. It's really built for the mass market, but it's not built for people like me, people who are from San Diego or who have visited San Diego before and who are looking for unique experiences, right? 
And so I could go to travel blocks. There's lots of different travel blocks that go through, but the quality and content of those blocks varies from site to site. And so this is where drives and detours comes in. It is a curated site built for working professionals who are looking for that smaller, more intimate destinations and drives. So if you're looking for a scenic drive in San Diego County, drives and detours is your site. If you're looking for that unique off the beaten path experience, drives and detours is your site. You can access it via web or mobile. And the great thing about it is that we're adding new drives, new destinations, and new experiences all the time. And so let's dig a little bit more into the business. And I'm going to turn this over to my coworker, Paul. Thanks. So yeah, let's take a look at the market for vehicle-based travel. As you can tell, it's big, it's growing. Uh, COVID accelerated it, and people plan on doing more of it. In fact, just this morning, my wife shared an infographic from Deloitte uh, showing some of the same trends that you see on the slide behind me. Um, one of the things that might come to mind is gas prices, but that's actually affected airline uh, travel and prices as well. So car travel can be more attractive, especially if you have a family. Um, you know, we also went out and spoke to a bunch of people at different points around San Diego just to validate this data for ourselves. And we went even further and did an online survey and found that, for example, people in the leisure driver category take their car on at least six out-of-town trips per year, uh, some of them a lot more. And almost 90% of them said that they like taking back roads at least part of the time so they can stop and check stuff out along the way. And that's a really important point because Google Maps is great at getting you from B to B, but it doesn't suggest other routes or pit stops based on your interests, and it doesn't tell you anything about all the stuff you're passing along the way. So we're approaching this business through uh, two layers. The first is a content library, which you can think of as sort of like a blog, but it's not regional or super niche like blogs tend to be. And then the other layer is the tools <coughs> and interactive content that blogs lack. So in the case of our MVP, that's the ability to browse and filter content on a map, as well as share these driving routes as opposed to just getting directions to one point. And then later on, we're gonna add in stuff like location activated media, as well as narrated tours with some of our partners. Now to monetize, at least initially, we're gonna focus just on affiliate marketing, um, but as our content and our features grow, we're gonna layer in additional revenue streams. Uh, right now, we're focused on user acquisition, so that means we need content. Um, we've decided to focus here in our own backyard in San Diego because it'll be easier for us to create and curate that content ourselves. Um, we're also working with local partners like the Del Mar Historical Society, uh, and they're interesting because they're volunteer-based, they have a very small budget, so working with somebody like us to expand their, their reach and get a potentially new audiences um, uh, attracted to them. Later on, as we get more customers on our platform, we'll be able to attract more content partners, but the tools and templates that we develop with these early partners will help us later on down the road because those next partners will be able to contribute content to our platform without us having to do the work, but still maintain the aesthetic and look and feel that we're, that we're going for. So Pete talked a little bit about some of the competition. Um, some of the other competitors in the space are going after this from a B2B perspective. We didn't feel like that really worked um, for us. Uh, we found that it seemed like it was uh, hindering their ability to scale and really deliver on consumer value. Um, and then you can see there's also been a couple of acquisitions in the space as well. Uh, the team includes myself and Pete. I have a background in new product development and marketing. Pete's got a background in operations and finance. Uh, as you can see from our roadmap, I mentioned that um, we just launched our MVP by October. We'd like to um, focus on uh, trying to raise a pre-seed round and then hire, bring on a uh, technical co-founder by the end of the year. So right now, we could really use your help. Uh, follow us on Instagram, check out our website, sign up for our newsletter, um, share us. And then also, um, if you're interested in investing in the uh, tourism tech space uh, like we are, uh, we'd love to talk to you. Thank you. Yeah, there's, there's, so yeah, social media was obviously the first channel, like we're going to reach out to social media, follow us on Instagram. 
But working with these partnerships, like the curated partnerships, we're hoping that like we'll promote them, they'll help promote us um, because we'll have stories about their businesses. So as an example, the California War Center, you know, we put together a blog post about them, we will be posting about them, and we hope that they'll do that in time. So that's us kind of starting organically in the San Diego area with uh, user group. And just as a follow up to that, as you expand outside of San Diego, how are you going to uh, drive content and how are you going to validate that it's you know, good content? Ideally, we're going to get local ambassadors or regional ambassadors who are going to be responsible for content for certain areas of the country so that they can help curate the content and validate the content. One of the challenges that people have with blogs and whatnot is that the content gets stale. And so we will have those regional ambassadors review the content on a regular basis to ensure it's up to date and it's refreshed. It's extendable to if somebody from out of town to apply to San Diego and then you know, build on the experience there rather than just going to you know, Tijuana or whatever it happens. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, uh, if you've been here several times, you've kind of you know, been there and done that and done all the big things. Absolutely. I mean, some of the people that we spoke to mentioned that specifically. They were looking for other things to do, other parts of the county to explore. And initially, affiliate revenue? Yep. Can that cover the expenses of the business, or is it just We're not sure yet. I mean, right now, our focus is on growing the user base. And once we've gotten to the user base, we'll work on really pushing the monetization part of it, whether that's affiliate marketing, advertising, or merchandising. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. It's my pleasure to introduce Andrea Baxter, uh, MSBA, <coughs> BA in Business Analytics, correct? Uh, for Brady, Clark 2022. And she'll speak to you about data farm. I have not yet begun to farm. Thank you, Tim. <laughs> My name is Andrea Baxter, and this is I have not yet begun to farm. Any John Paul Jones hands here? No? Okay. Uh, the data farm. So, um, like I said, I'm working on my master's in business analytics here at Brady, and I'm also an avocado farmer. And uh, a few months ago, my husband and I, uh, we wanted to buy a farm because my parents have one in Florida. We needed something a little bit closer so we could go often, and we like guacamole, so uh, we <laughs> thought avocados would be a great thing to farm, right? Um, it didn't take us very long to figure out that we knew nothing about farming. Um, but we did do a lot of research and we found out that there were a lot of challenges that farmers were experiencing. Number one was drought, right? We have minimal rainfall, uh, really high uh, temperatures, and soaring water prices. Um, avocados have a thing called alternate bearing cycles. So about after three to four years, they start bearing fruit, and then they'll bear lots of little fruit, and then the next year they'll bear big fruit, but very few quantities. So what the manager has to do is manage the nutrients so that they can um, establish a common crop size because in profit, profitability is only established through consistency. So maintaining the nutrients, um, managing the canopy or the powerhouse of the tree, that's all important in growing avocados. Um, controlling diseases. Um, we started working with UCR, uh, plant pathologist, Dr. Jim Adabaskich, and um, he has been working on it with uh, citrus and different kinds of crop commodities. Um, and he's been um, testing the efficacy of new um, fungicides uh, to, so that the USDA can um, release them to the market, and that's happening on our farm. The biggest thing that brought us to I have not yet begun to farm was the gap between the research and the farm owner. How do I implement this? How can I grow these avocados when I know nothing? So the avocado market, it's $2.5 billion a year in the United States. 90% of the avocados that are grown are grown in California from the San Joaquin Valley to San Diego and followed by Florida and Hawaii. And it's a fragmented industry. So 5,000 farmers are farming around 50,000 acres. And it, we're talking about 13 acres they're managing. So they're either generational farmers. They're passing down their information. They're either new farmers like me that are trying to you know, give it a go. And or they um, are using a management company where it requires 
hundreds of dollars per acre per, per month for them to water trees, chemigate them, make sure that they're getting everything they need so that you can become profitable. So our solution is a data farm app. It does two things. The first thing it does is it develops a crop coefficient. Every commodity has a coefficient when they're establishing the water needs. The water needs is established by the EVO transpiration equation. Basically, how much water the roots absorb and how much water the leaves um, evaporate. So the problem with this is that the numbers that they give you are based on geographical data in California. So if I'm growing my avocado in San Diego or in Riverside, I'm getting the same ET. I'm getting the same uh, crop coefficient. I think we can make that better. We can use our soil information. We can uh, use uh, whether or not we have erosion, runoff, um, weather. The next thing that we can do is we can calculate the health. With our trials, um, our avocado trials with uh, UCR, we've been studying 450 avocados, taking soil samples, root samples, taking pictures of them. And with my business analytics background now, I think that we can uh, create an algorithm using a convolutional neural, neural network that basically extracts features from an image, takes them through several layers, and can categorize them so that I can tell the farmer what disease they have and the concentration of it just based on a picture, and then calculate the tree health. So my value proposition is that I'm providing this research to the palm of their hand. It's easy access. I'm getting real-time data. I'm calculating the health of the tree so that I'm, op I'm optimizing resources, and I'm also predicting their crop yield so that I can maximize their profit. Our milestones in spring, we started working with UCR, and we did our study on the 450 uh, trees. Uh, this summer, we got approved on the capstone um, so that we can use the data that we generated from our experiments um, to calculate the crop coefficient and the uh, image analysis. And um, we are also working with Rancho Water District in Temecula. They have provided um, over 1,500 um, data uh, sets from agricultural users. And um, we hope to develop the app later on this summer and release the beta app in the fall. So our big ask is um, if there are any software developers that would like to uh, help and join, um, that would be awesome. And if there are any avocado farmers that would like to participate in our avocado trials, that would also be great. This is my contact information and thank you for your time. So would your revenue stream then come from sales or subscription of the app? I'm still working on that. I, I'm not I'm not quite sure exactly how we would make that work, but it would either be, um, I want to make the app be less than a management company, but I also maybe add some, um, some ads into it or um, take it a little bit further where it can connect farmers to other farmers, share practices, run experiments. Um, hey, I'm doing this, what are you doing? What should you get from that? Um, and make it uh, bigger. So I'm still, I'm still exploring. Seems like that's a valuable community that you're at. You're kind of yes. going to give them a lot of good information. Yes. And then you'll have a database of the entire avocado industry in California. That's what I'm hoping for. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, have you looked at other software uh, on the sensor side, on the AI mm -hmm. side? Uh, Companies that are focused focus on this problem, like irrigation sensors or soil sensors or satellite pictures. I know uh, yeah, there's AI, or there's AI com companies that combine all of that data together, and then there's, I think there's a local company as well that targets the same problem. Uh, I haven't seen that on avocado specifically, mm -hmm. and because of the um, the challenges that avocado farmers face, um, I I think that would be more uh, folks to that option specifically. Thank you, India. Thank you. Our next company is 
from Start Blue, and it's actually a combination of San Diego State as well as UCSD. <laughs> My name is Lenny Schwartz, and I'm the Director of Marketing for Kaipona Solutions. Hello, everyone. I'm Edward Bonios, and I'm the Lead Mechanical Engineer for Kaipona Solutions. There's a shocking statistic that 80% of global marine pollution comes from agriculture runoff, untreated sewage, and pesticides and nutrients entering our waterways. And this isn't just an environmental problem. It actually affects the health of you and your families. In Southern California alone, 1.5 million people get sick from polluted waterways each year, and it certainly doesn't help that San Diego is home to the dirtiest and most polluted beach in the entire state. This is exactly why Kaipona Solutions was started. So we begin to do a little bit of research on who's installing storm drains and who's maintaining them. And it turns out it's government municipalities, ports, airports, cities, coastal enterprises, and land developers. And the actual decision makers are the directors of stormwater and transportation and the civil and environmental engineers on the project. We will be capturing a piece of the $7.9 billion U.S. stormwater management market and have plans to start in California, which spent $700 million on stormwater filtration in 2020 alone. So we've kept our customers in mind at the forefront of every decision we've made on our product design so far. We conducted interviews of over 30 members of our target market, and the results speak for themselves. 76% of the people we talked to are unsatisfied with their current stormwater solutions and are actively looking for new solutions. 70% are most concerned with cost and maintenance, and it really sealed the deal for us when 100% of the people we talked to wanted to be contacted when we took our product to market. Mm -hmm. Our solution is a three basin system that fits directly in the curb and gutter line and filters water in a patented sequence before reaching the nearest storm drain inlet. We never block the existing storm drain and you can park your car over the entire system. Our solution is low cost, requires little maintenance, and has a low spatial footprint. We're also equipped with an IoT device that captures data on things like flow rates, contaminants, and can even signal maintenance cycles, which is a major pain point in the stormwater industry. So with one maintenance cycle, we have the ability to filter out 28 pounds of contaminants from entering our waterways. And if we install 365 devices, each with four maintenance cycles per year, we can remove over 40,000 pounds of contaminants from entering our waterways. We recently ran testing on our flow rate capacity and found that we can withstand a flow rate of over 100 gallons per minute, and this number is expected to rise as soon as we can purchase another pump. So when it comes to the competition, Kaipona Solutions actually has a lot of advantages. The four most common solutions are actually the one four, with SOP and the SOC being the most common. These are usually seen as low impact solutions to the problem, but in actuality, they actually just increase the problem by increasing uh, chances of flooding. The last two, Fulterra and BioClean, are also seen as good advantages and good solutions. However, they're very high cost and high footprint. For example, Fulterra costs about $1.5 million to install a single one on a landscaping uh, site, and BioClean takes up about 105 cubic yards to actually install it. Now, why Kaipona? So, the world is taking notice of the stormwater issue. A lot of cities across the world are actually increasing their tax initiatives for stormwater solutions, with San Diego being one of the leading ones. Um, they actually just approved $733 million for the stormwater solution. We actually just partnered with the Surfrider Foundation, one of the world's largest uh, advocates for wa water solutions. Um, also, we meet all of the United Nations Sustainable Goals for uh, stormwater, and we're 95% cheaper and only take about 1% of the spatial footprint that other solutions bring. We operate on a B2B and B2G business model, generating revenue through direct sales and our subscription-based model for the IoT data and supply renewals. Our current target set price is uh, about $3,600, which would give us a profit margin of 67%. We're currently asking for a $300,000 investment on a convertible note for things like monitoring and data, setting up our manufacturing, and uh, other materials. So our recent accomplishments. So we recently won $30,000 in uh, prize money with 5,000 actually coming from the UCSD Triton Innovation Challenge. Um, we're currently working on our proof of concept, actually installing our very first system this summer in Maui, Hawaii. Um, we're also getting prepared to uh, apply for a non-provisional patent at the end of this year. And also we've been featured in four um, articles across UC, uh, across UC San Diego and San Diego. So our team, our team goes across the board from business to marketing to engineering. Um, with all three of our engineers actually graduating or about to graduate in two weeks here uh, from UCSD. Um, myself being a mechanical, we have a, a chemical as well as a structural engineer. Um, what we're asking for today. So currently we're looking at connections with municipalities uh, as well as water boards across cities. 
Um, we're also asking for assistance to go to market and B2B sales, um, as well as seeking 300,000 in pre funding and access to IoT professionals. Here's all of our contact info, and thank you very much. since I believe uh, that it's the Clean Water Act 1971, I believe it's called. Um, every new land development site since then has to have some sort of stormwater filtration on it. And it sounds like from, a, from an ask, you're going to look at the municipality and the Board of Water Expansion first. Have you thought about going to private market first and then being land developers? Yeah, um, a lot of, so we've had a lot of interest from land developers. Uh, they just kind of want the stamp approval from cities and municipalities. So that's kind of what we're working yeah. Yeah. So what's the basis of your patent? Just how far does that keep others out if your idea really takes off? Um, it covers the filtration mechanism. Um, so the device itself, not necessarily the filters. Um, but it, yeah, it covers the device itself. And we have a question to audience. Now, when you're discussing your runoff capacity, you mentioned a pump. Is this does this product have a pump in it? No, it's uh, there's no moving parts required. Uh, we were when we were running our testing, we needed to pump a certain amount of water through it, and so we were only able to pump uh, 100 gallons per minute. And so once we can purchase a pump that's going to be able to push more water through our device, we'll have updated capacity. Is it um? So it seems like a custom design and drawing. Because every single sewer is a little bit different, and then you've got to fit this filtration system in a little puzzle, yes, and then put it on top. And so it is. Yes. I mean, and you're able to do that for about two thousand dollars. Yes. Yes. That's so crazy. The, uh, the great aspect about it is that uh, when we design the system, we made sure that all of the filters are removable. So what, depending on what a city needed, is the filter we actually place in. So, um, for example, uh, there's filter mats that we can use for cities that are more on a decline, so water can filter easily through in and out. But for cities that are more on a flatbed and can't push as water as easily, we have um, uh, carbon fiber balls um, that work a lot easier when water is not flowing as fast or as much. Oh, so it's the right product for the right application, and you guys have the engineering team to make that possible. Yes, exactly. Well, all the teams will be available for questions after this. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, a lady, um, student from our finance, our MS in finance, our uh, class of 2022, I'm sorry, Belladuran, and she will talk to you about our story. Thank you. Yeah. It all starts uh, in the painful process, and uh, it is even more painful if you are an international student like me. I'm Bhavya Velayudan, and I'm a Master of Finance student here at Bailey School of Management. Now, what is the easiest way of getting the job? Yeah, yeah. You talk to an existing employee, you get all the info that you need from them, you get a backdoor reference, and yeah, you get the job. But no, that sounds like a dream. It sounds more like an impossible thing. Why? Why? That's a question. Because this is not the easiest way to get a job. This is the toughest way to get the job. But why? Why is this the toughest way of getting the job? Because the access to talk to an existing employee is so tough. For me, myself as a job seeker, I know how painful it is. If this is a real pain for a job seeker, what is the current workarounds that we have? We have like thousands of WhatsApp and WeChat groups that we have. Now, this is the real time screenshots from a couple of the WhatsApp groups that I am in. Now, what's the second workaround? Uh, 
you're checking your social circle, you're checking your professional circle. Then what do you do next? You log into LinkedIn, you send out tons of connection requests and pray that they accept your interest first. And then be kind enough to reply to your chats. So I started validating this, how painful it is for the other job seekers too. I ran surveys, I spoke to my classmates, other job seekers, I found that there are top four pain points that a job seeker actually undergo. So what are our spread solutions for this? We have automatic job application tracking tool. Uh, we have a job seeker employee connect and we have an employee referral network building system and my favorite, the anonymous decision board. So what does this do? You searching jobs in the US is a volume game. It's like the more you apply, the more your conversion rate is. And it's a manual process. You, you just can't do it on the Excel sheet. So this eliminates all your manual process irrespective of on which platform you apply for the job. Now, the job seeker employee connect. Let's say I apply for a job at Tesla and Kim is already working at Tesla, is already there on the portal as another job seeker. Our Square platform will nudge me connect with Kim so that I could actually get info. So we actually ask a question whether uh, during sign up, whether they are open for connect with other job seekers. So what's the next one? The restaurant network building. Now, the biggest gap of LinkedIn is that when you send out a connection request to someone, you have absolutely no idea whether the other person is interested in networking with you. So we ask them a question during user sign up whether they are open for referral network building, which eliminates all the ghosting and the cold emails and different strategies that you need to do for reference. Now, the anonymous discussion board. We are mindful of the privacy of the users that we have in our platform. LinkedIn is full of rainbows and unicorns. People talk only good things about it. But that is not going to add value for me as a job seeker or other job seekers on the platform. So this is an opportunity where people can talk what is exactly happening in their organization. And also as a job seeker for one small information, I need to actually go through like what dozens of websites to get one information. So this anonymous discussion board is a one-stop solution for all the job search processes that one needs. Now, what is our market? We are currently looking only to the US market, especially to the IT tech jobs, but to start with, we are using the university students and alums. Now, the focus is to get out the product in three months, uh, build in job seeker communities in six months, and then finally focus only for the tech jobs in the US. Now, the gold market plan, LinkedIn, Glassdoor, and Indeed can use all our tools to fill in their gaps, also, we can customize this for the university career center, which will be like a big leverage for uh, all the universities to track how the students are applying for jobs. Now, the go-to-market, we are not opening to the public right now. Uh, the plan is to start out with ready, slowly open up to UCSD, and then with all of the University of California, and then finally to the public. Now, the business model. Of course, the platform is free, but we are looking for the ads and also partnerships with uh, staffing agencies and enterprises and HR consultancy. When I had this idea, I didn't even have to think twice who my co-founder should, should be. Shabi was my childhood best friend. He's an incredibly talented techie. He's the CEO and founder of Alcore, which he's actually running back in India. And uh, don't climb up lots of stairs. Take the escalator of R squared and land in your dream job. Thanks a lot for listening to me. Uh, we have an MVP. Uh, we are still customizing it uh, on how to um, cater ready students. Uh, we, it, I think it should be out by uh, June 15. That is the target that we have set. Uh, but the public solution will be by end of this month. Mm -hmm.
Mm -hmm. and you have a way to contact the alumni? And uh, allowed to? Uh, yes, so I have been talking to uh, Italia Santa Claus, alumni Santa mm -hmm. and how we can leverage this to start up. So what's your sort of barrier to entry? Is this kind of a speed to market thing that you refer to? I mean, why couldn't LinkedIn copy what you're doing? So LinkedIn is not trying to do this, right? If they could do, they could actually have done it like years before, because LinkedIn has been here for 20 years they haven't done it. Uh, so this is mainly to fill that gap. At the same time, we are taking that 18 months to make sure that uh, our tool is actually running and reading data so that the tracking and the, uh, whatever facilities we are and then and it also gives that opportunity to build that top secret community because it, it actually runs on the community. How are you planning to build community? Oh, okay. So the real time pain points now we have like lots of WhatsApp groups and Telegram groups, Facebook, LinkedIn groups that we have. So by together when we are doing the students alum community, we are actually trying to because even as me or me, my uh, social circle, we all have been part of different different groups. So at first I have already ran a survey asking them whether they could be like our beta users. And we have like 132 people already signed up for it. So that's it. Thank you. So our next team from Start Our Radi is Caroline Olson, part of the Radi MBA 2023, and Javon Shapiri, and they are team satisfied. In April 2019, I ran my first marathon. I had no coach, no training program, and people didn't even think that I would finish. But when my mind is made up, it's going to happen. So not only did I finish the marathon, I won it. My name is Caroline Thomas Olsen, and my dream is running the Olympics in 2028. And as I set out to reach that goal, I have learned a lot about nutrition. And now my dream is to help educate other people so they can reach their goals through personalized eating. So we all know this unfortunate problem that all foods are not created equal. So here we have two muffins. To the left, that muffin has 150 calories. But the one to the right is a Starbucks muffin and that has 440 calories. And although they both satisfy your craving, the one to the left, has 150 calories and, and it makes you feel energized. It has 15 grams of protein, nine grams of fiber. But the one to the right, that one makes you feel sluggish. It makes you want to eat more. And that is because it has 21 grams of fat, barely any fiber and 40 grams of sugar. So that is why we have created Satisfy, food with purpose. But now you're probably thinking, well, what do you know about nutrition? Well, that is why I have a business partner in Javon. Thank you, Caroline. All right, so I'm Javon Shapuri, and I care about the details. So I'm a master's of science student in nutrition, and I have a background in biology. And while I might think that running 26 miles is kind of crazy, I also have a passion for fitness. I'm a personal trainer, yogi, and rowing coach. <laughs> and I have a common goal in building the world's leading healthy eating path. So my job is to make sure that every ingredient plays a role in our products. We want to leave you feeling satisfied both with taste and fullness so you can crush hunger throughout the day and feel energized. All right, introducing our blueberry collagen pre-workout muffin. <laughs> so first off, it looks pretty good, right? Would you believe me if I told you that this muffin has 15 grams of protein and only 150 calories? So I'm too good to be true. So looking at some of the ingredients that go into our muffins, we've got whole foods for micronutrients, uh, high protein with healthy fats, and uh, complex carbohydrates with high fiber. Digging in a little bit deeper, high fiber with nine grams, uh, 15 grams of protein, and only 150 calories. So what does this mean? Our muffins are gonna be, our products are gonna be easy to digest. They are nutrient dense with high quality ingredients. 
and they provide you with lean protein for muscle growth and sustainable energy throughout the day. So now transitioning, looking towards our market. If you didn't know already, there's an obvious increased interest in healthy food. And here alone in San Diego, there's 102 million search results for healthy food. We can look at our market size, our TAN in San Diego, it's about $77.5 million. And we can assume we get 1% of that market. Our SAM is looking at $770,000. So now let's look towards some of our potential early adopters. Meet Helen, she's a student athlete here at UCSD. Meet Paige, she's a foodie influencer. And lastly, meet Dave, he's a busy dad who wants a low calorie bedtime snack. So while we do want to reach as many people as possible, we need to start with customers that are most motivated about eating healthy. So how are we gonna make money, Kelly? <laughs> so our cost per muffin is $2. And we've surveyed over 100 people and found that 95% of those people are willing to pay $3.5 and 50% are willing to pay $5. So if we price our muffin at the competitor's price at 3.5, our margin will be 42.9%. And we will, Target the different willingness to pay by having different types of muffins. So we'll have one banana chocolate chunk muffin that we will price at 3.5. We would also have one superfood muffin and we will price it five dollars to capture that higher willingness to pay. So if you take a look at our competitors, which also are like small meals or snacks that have the high protein and healthy fats that we offer in our products, we see that our value proposition is that we want it, we want people to reach their goals through personalized eating habits. So our go-to-market strategy, we will be interacting directly with runners at running events and as John's yoga instructor at his yoga classes. We will also be interacting with people at farmers markets. We will be um, on campuses talking to student athletes. We will partner with supplement companies and we will also do influence marketing through my own personal brand as I become a better runner. So as of right now, we have finalized six muffin recipes, and we're also uh, recipe testing uh, brownies and cookies and blondies. We are launching our online uh, e-commerce store at the end of June, and we're excited to launch our first Kemp permanent cafe at the end of the year. So help us be the leading cafe for healthy food. We are seeking advisors in the food and health industry, and we have samples at the back. Thank you. Thank you. Build up a social media uh, presence. I we can market the business through 
microphone ready. Questions from the audience? My pleasure to introduce you, Don Fang. Don is a master's degree student in electrical and computer engineering and part of our Stardar uh, impact. Yes, excuse me, Stardar impact. Yes. Right, thank you, Tim. Right. Hi, everyone. My name is Alan, and I'm a co founder of Walmart. Walmart is personalized mental wellness done right. The problem we are tackling is depression and related anxiety, stress, and burnout. Before COVID, approximately 8% of Americans experienced depression. And since COVID, this number has quadrupled to over 32%. Left untreated, depression has a total economic burden of over $210 billion. Today, about 20% receive minimally effective care, and there is no personalized data-driven guidance. This is where Walmart comes in. What we do is we leverage smartwatch and smartphone data combined with user logs to determine which variables like sleep, diet, exercise, or social engagement best explains a user's depressed mood. This allows our coaches to create personalized wellness plans or PWPs that intervene on these specific lifestyle factors. For example, in our prior clinical trial, we had a case where whenever one person exercised too little or even too much, on the next day, they consistently experienced an, an increase in depressive symptoms. So in this case, our coach would create a personalized wellness plan one-on-one -on -one with the user based on their clinical data to put them in the Goldilocks zone for exercise, not too much or too little. So Walmart is quantified. Our cross-platform app syncs with any smartwatch to map out users' lifestyles. We are personalized. Our PWPs are designed with our patent-pending AI technology to fit into users' existing lifestyles. We are connected. Our certified coaches help users um, maintain their habits and their personal wellness journey. And most importantly, we are clinically proven. Walmart is driven by research out of heat labs at the UCSC School of Medicine. Compared to our competitors, um, like data tracking platforms like Feel, telehealth platforms like BetterHelp, and meditation apps like Calm, Walmart is backed by specific research and clinical trials coming out of heat labs, not just broad population-based studies in the field. In a recent Walmart digital trial, 72% of our users showed an improved outcome. And Walmart alone has a health behaviors focus. Our affordable coaches help users create and maintain healthy habits in sleep, diet, exercise, and positivity. Walmart will be offered through a SaaS business model. We have a mobile app that is powered by a cloud-based machine learning backend, all developed in-house. We have a digital PWP with an optional coaching add-on. To account for this option, we have a flexible pricing by subscription tier. This all allows for high scalable growth in the B2C and B2B markets. Our initial go to market strategy will be to build traction in the consumer market as we iterate and, um, on our platform's offerings and competitive positioning. Then we'll leverage our position to obtain lucrative B2C partnerships, like with educational institutions like UCSD, who is a current partner in our clinical trial and as well as with other corporate firms. In terms of market potential, Walmart has a total available market of $12.5 billion. Of this, there is a $7 billion SAM, and we're confident we can obtain 15% or 1 billion of the SAM because we have a powerful product market fit. Based on our customer interviews and over 185 survey respondents, people want a solution that is accessible, cost-effective, personalized, quantified, and sustainable. Walmart is all that and more. This could be why 53% of respondents left their information to be the first to try Walmart. In terms of social impact, we want 
for individuals, we want to build greater psychological resilience, which in turn translates to a lower um, comorbid, amount of comorbid problems. For society, this means lower direct and indirect medical costs, as well as an overall improvement in the quality of life and satisfaction of people. Here at Walmart, we have an amazing team with a diverse skill set, with a perfect blend of skills to deliver this compelling solution, um, including Jody Mishra and Nakshino Nathan on the right, or my right and your left, um, who are the directors here at the labs at the UCSC School of Medicine. Our team has over 10 years of experience each in clinical psychology, um, digital health, neuroscience, software engineering, and over seven in business finance and marketing. As President Biden said in his State of the Union address, we have an ongoing national mental health crisis with a severe shortage of care providers. I believe Walmart is well positioned to fill this gap. We are currently in the pre-seed stage and conducting our second clinical trial and I expect positive results within six months to a year. So we are currently seeking mentors and connections that can help you find a power solution. And I do have one ask for you all, members of our audience, um, either tonight or tomorrow, please reach out to a loved one that might be struggling and just tell them how much they need to. Thank you. Thank you, so then your revenue is going to be a subscription to, to an app. Is that going to be, I'm correct on that, right? Yes, that's correct. That's going to be funded by the consumer or is it something that we could give to the insurance companies, uh, even if you have clinical data to back it up? That, that's a great question. So on the B2C side, we are directly supported by the consumers. So we actually price this according to the um, lowest to pay. Um, we offer like an $80 digital only subscription and with a coaching add-on that adds up to $160 for consumers. But as you suggested, we will partner with um, educational institutions like UCSD, where we can either go through the SHIP health insurance or other programs to offer it um, to students, um, as well as uh, approach other corporate firms. I guess that was one thing like Kaiser, all the big number of people who have you know, 78 million lives covered. Yeah, I think it's a great value add to them because we lower their um, underwriting this and just improve people's health. I guess that it feels like behavioral using data to back up behavioral coaching. Yes. Um, it, I mean, it, it, the closest thing to that is like new. Have you looked at kind of how, how do you think to like compare to them in terms so, of like an opportunity okay. to be that big? So I believe new is only focused on exercise. Whereas we focus on other factors, including like sleep, diet, and social engagement. So exercise is great, but maybe it's not for everyone. Um, other people might require a sleep plan or a diet plan to feel better. And so we offer these different choices for them. What percentage of people are still providing? Because it sounds like in addition to just getting the data off my watch, I also have to tell you so. Right. I think I probably wouldn't keep that up for very long. Right. That's so great. what percentage of people are in that category? So I'm not sure what the exact percentage is, but since we are targeting mild to moderate depression and not severe cases, for severe, for severe cases, we refer them to local um, therapists that can handle the higher acuity. But for mild to moderate depression, um, we do offer a coaching service, which should help users stay accountable and keep up with their plans week to week. Additionally, we're designing our mobile app to be as low friction as possible, so you can enter all that information really quick. Um, with only just a few minutes of your time already. I'm Question? sorry if I missed um, that part, but you mentioned the customized component and then AI. Is AI producing the customized component, or do you still need a coach involved in sort of reviewing and adjusting to your example for exercising too much or too little? That's a great question. Um, so the AI um, essentially it spits out a list of factors that you can work on, like different exercise plans or different sleep plans. Um, but that might not be appropriate for everyone. So as an example, maybe somebody is working a graveyard shift and they can't really change their sleep plans, but uh, it is kind of messed up. 
So in that case, our coach can work with them to maybe move to the next thing on the list. So maybe like exercise might be more appropriate because um, they can't change their sleeping patterns. So it's a combination of both uh, the AI and the coach. Thank you. Can you know? so, my, first of all, great presentation. But my question was kind of related to hers a little bit, and it has to do with the AI and the coach. Like, how are you getting these coaches? And how are you getting it? Will you have it in a format that will eventually be scalable? Mm -hmm. right. So initially, our coaching will be supported by um, uh, Dr. Rohanathan and Dr. Luna. Um, so they are trained clinical psychologists, um, and they'll serve as our head coaches in the beginning. And as we scale up, then we'll hire more coaches at market rate for providers. Um, I can take questions, but he's available after the show. So. <laughs> but thank you. Next time, I would like to ask the judges to step aside a little and, and go score a piece for a person. And at this time, I would like to invite the audience to also vote for your favorite Star Our Company presentation. So you do this if you're online, please scan the QR code. Um, if you could use your phone and scan it here, that'd be great too. <laughs> or you could go to bit.ly bit slash demo day 0601. That's the day's case. And uh, in the meantime, I am going to have our Brady entrepreneur advocate Karen Jensen come up and tell us more about Start Blue, and then followed by Tim Ford, who will talk about pro upcoming programs at CU. So, thank you all. I just wanted to let you know we have just concluded the first cohort of our brand new Start Our Program, Start Blue. Start Blue is formed in partnership with our friends at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. We are ready and looking for our next group of innovators who are ready to tackle ocean-related ideas, problems, challenges, through science and engineering solutions. If this is you, we'd love to have you join our next cohort. We have applications that are currently open through July 8th. We are also seeking mentors for our next cohort. So if you're interested in mentoring, you don't necessarily have to have a ton of experience in ocean-related technology. We are open mentors from all sorts of backgrounds. Our teams are always looking for something new and different. You've heard from one of our teams this evening, Tycona Solutions. Um, uh, another one of our representatives, um, Kim Pendergrass from Algeon Materials is also here tonight. We had a great uh, demo day last week and we look forward to our next group of teams who will take us on our next journey. Well, as I said earlier today, um, the core of our success, the core I think of, of entrepreneurial success family is the best in the networks. The depth, breadth, and ethics of those that we can bring in one to advise, coach, play various roles. Uh, we are growing our entrepreneurs network, usually by invitation only. We do take referrals from those that are already in the network. And then we'll be sending out surveys to be able to curate the relationships to understand your business expertise, your technology and science expertise, the amount of time you have, and the level at which you like to come. Do you like to advise students at this level that we've demonstrated here at Demo Day, or do you like to come and advise at a more advanced level? So we're growing these networks substantially. Catalyst Fund is a fund that helps students from this point and fill a gap between, between the point that some of these students are now and where they might be invested. Uh, thanks to a contact we have with a local bank, we will be launching the fund uh, with small awards for students with female and underrepresented founders, and those applications and now so will be coming out shortly. But we need to grow this fund substantially so that we can support these teams and many others to proceed and ready uh, to rise. I was speaking earlier uh, to a few folks about this new pilot program, the Venture Fellows Program. It's a really interesting program where we match <coughs> really two stages of startup, if you will. Ones that are somewhat established, Mercury Health and Limar AI are the two that we're working with now that are somewhat established. These are uh, both engineering founders. One needed their uh, accounting systems developed. 
and other than the, their financial systems. So we flew these projects out to the Brady grad students. We have a master's in finance program. We have a master's in professional accounting. We match students to these projects and put a mentor on top. Well, these students are getting real world experience and the, the companies are getting very valuable uh, content and, and uh, material for their startup. The other level is scientific and engineering discoveries that are still essentially in the lab, but that have shown series of results. So we have four of these projects, ones that, uh, that have been scoped out. What the need here is for deep market research. The faculty and the principal investigators understand that there's a market opportunity. They may not know, in fact, in some cases, there may be several market opportunities. We are scoping these projects for uh, Brady graduate students, as well as uh, other graduate students. We have one team, for example, that are three MBAs and one uh, physics uh, PhD student who's actually here with us this evening. These, these projects are looking at the market opportunities for early pre-company pre formation, but fairly well uh, proven technologies and science that might affect anywhere from uh, nucleic acid uh, sensors to piezo foam, uh, electronic uh, mechanical sensors, excuse me, not electronic, mechanical sensors. We have one that's looking at the viability of a crystal prosthetic. So the Venture Fellows Program is off and running as well. They're ready to go. All right. <laughs> Access and inclusion. I can talk to you about that afterwards. <laughs> but it looks like and which you understand. Now it's going to do the second hand. Okay. okay. So um, I ended up focusing more on companies I thought that could get revenue pretty quickly and prove out the business that way. That kind of like put down uh, like drivers and detours. You know, because I think it's going to take a lot longer to build the content and get to a revenue stream there. I haven't begun to farm. I think that's the same kind of thing. It's a community and it's going to take a while to get to, you know, really proving out if people are going to pay for this and things like that. R squared, there's just, there's, that's a big opportunity. And I think it's really interesting. I think the presentation probably, like, I know more about it than sort of the presentation sort of said. And there's been a lot of companies in the space that have kind of, you know, grown and blown up. Um, but I do like starting it with, at the school and uh, and as a great start. So that leaves, uh, oh, I guess I just announced the whole thing. <laughs> so, so, so second place will go to Satisfied. Detail, and I believe the story you tell creates the reality you see. So, um, I biased think, by the buffet. Yeah, <laughs> by the buffet. and yeah, and um, it was a question like, why, why a muffin? Like, no, aren't health foods? Why would you brand a muffin first? And it was like, for me, it was like, no, a muffin is exactly the <laughs> <laughs> because no one's done that before. And I think, I think you're gonna have a wonderful career, and I think. Um, yeah, I have a fund that lends money against the inventory of emerging consumer brands that are much, much bigger. But I would focus on your weekly metrics and your customer acquisition costs and your lifetime value. And then as soon as you can pay yourself, then you don't, you'll never fail because you'll never give up. And so that would be my advice to you. And <laughs>
just want to thank all the teams that helped to get all this great job. I also want to thank you, audience and judges, and all our mentors who help us so much um, in the program. So thank you so much for coming, and we look forward to seeing you at other Star Art Demo Days. I have one final announcement. Uh, for any teams that would like to begin preparing now, we have... Um, I Join. Keep talking. Keep talking. So we have a slide uh, to show, uh, advertise our uh, border innovation challenge. So it's a challenge that looks at environmental health and logistical challenges at the border. This is a multi-university competition. It is a multinational competition as we invite universities from Mexico as well. We will be uh, announcing this a little more formally, including workshops, uh, information sessions, and then of course the finals. Uh, of many steps leading up to the finals on December 1st. So if any teams want to get to work on that now, please feel free to get, get an early start and we'll look forward to uh, engaging you more in August. And then finally, thank you to Diana for doing such a great job. Those online, there's the connection information, but yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> With the judges, 